I'm honored to be here. Um, I'm a research scientist at the Learning, Innovation, and Technology Lab at Harvard University in a School of Education. And in this talk, I just want to share with you some of our projects that, that I've been working on uh, along with my team. And I just wanted to show you some kind of lessons learned and some critical questions that I think are useful to ask, both as people who are looking at augmented reality for education from a critical lens when you're researching and also from uh, when you're looking at augmented reality technology when you're designing these kind of things. So hopefully by the end of this talk, I'll leave you with some interesting questions to ask yourselves as you consider augmented reality experiences. And just as, a, as an orientation for people who don't know what augmented reality is or how it falls into the spectrum. Basically, there's this uh, mixed reality spectrum that's been proposed that ranges from environments that are very real and they don't contain any kind of like virtual information in them. Um, and on the other side, it's fully virtual environments like virtual reality headsets where you put on something on your, on your senses, you kind of cover up all your senses and then you just get teleported into a virtual um, 3D environment. So that's virtual reality on one side, real reality, physical reality on the other side. And in the middle, there's this interesting space of uh, augmented, basically mixing the two realities together. And so there's something called augmented virtuality in which you take a virtual space and you add some piece of the real world into it, such as a live camera feed that goes into this, uh, into this Minecraft scene, for example. And then on the other side, there's augmented reality where you take the real world and then you add some virtual elements into it. And there's many different ways of doing augmented reality. So there's projection-based augmented reality where you just have a projector and you're shining virt a virtual scene onto a real object, ending up with this blended experience, such as this sandbox over here. You also have mobile phones that have cameras on them and they can act like magic lenses where you're just looking at the real environment and you're seeing extra information on top of the real environment. And then there's also headsets. And this is what I work with these days. These are headsets that you wear on your head and then you get to have your hands free to physically interact with physical objects. Um, and there's kind of some varieties of other kinds of devices in the middle here, but this is mostly of what's considered augmented. Now, in terms of motivation for this talk, um, I'm in a school of education and I'm interested in using these technologies for educating people. Uh, and there's lots of excitement about mixed reality experiences, both augmented reality, virtual reality, everything in between. Um, but when talking to educators, there's quite a bit of skepticism. Like there's excitement about it, but also people are skeptical about it. Um, as you know, educational systems in general are pretty resistant to change uh, and to sort of introducing new technologies to revolutionize the way things are. And so um, the, the skepticism is, is kind of part of that process. Um, there's multiple reasons for why people are skeptical. One is that uh, there's lots of barriers to entry and access of these technologies. So, uh, you need devices, you need internet connectivity, you need applications that are designed for the curriculum, you need teachers that are well versed in these technologies and are able to customize the experience for their students. Um, so there's lots of kind of like barriers to getting these technologies into the hands of, of educators. There's also high costs, both in terms of some of these devices and then also in terms of the development of making these experiences. So you can see on the picture on the top right here, these people are wearing Microsoft HoloLens devices, which are a few thousand dollars each on their head. So you can imagine that providing these for every student is a challenge. Uh, also the experiences that you get to build and have on these devices are expensive to make because they're, they're more complicated to make than a, just a normal 2D screen application or a computer application. Um, just because they're three-dimensional, they require a certain level of fidelity, they require a certain level of interactivity so that students can, uh, can play with them individually. So they're quite expensive to make. Um, also, from the perspective of designers, we're also educators, there's a lot of understanding of familiarity for how to design these things properly and what kind of effects they have on people. Um, and so, 
the takeaway here is that there's a need for more detailed research findings that can tell us when these technologies are useful, in what contexts are they useful, and when are they not useful, so that with this information, we may be able to approach educational organizations uh, and be able to specifically say, look, for this specific use case, this technology has been shown to be very useful, uh, but for other for this other use case, it's not too useful. So you know, you, you can make an informed decision when uh, trying to adopt these technologies. So in this talk, I hope to to give you a few takeaways, such that, uh, for example, that AR can be both helpful and also damaging to learning, depending on the context and depending on who the users and the activities are. AR impacts people differently, depending on their roles, depending on what they do. Uh, also, I want to show you how AR failures can reveal better non-AR uh, educational ideas. This is based on our, on our experiences building AR. And then I also want to talk to you about how to decompose the learning components of an AR experience so that you can understand what makes an AR experience good or not good. Uh, and I'll do this in the context of maker spaces because this is what I've been focusing on for the last few years. And this is a picture of a makerspace. And there's some really interesting things to see here. So makerspaces are environments where uh, people have physical access to lots of tools. You can see in the background here, there's lots of physical machining tools. Uh, on the table here, there's lots of electronics that people are playing with. Uh, there's probably in the background, uh, this might be an outdated picture, but there's nowadays these spaces have 3D printers, laser cutters, things like that. So there's spaces where students and anybody who's interested in making a physical object can basically sometimes even just go into, get trained to use the tools, and then they have free reign to be able to uh, create whatever they imagine. And you can see that these folks are working together with each other. There's no teacher in this photograph because usually in these maker spaces, um, there's no sort of structured instruction. It's not like a classroom. It's more like active learning where the students are working with each other and with the materials in order to create interesting things that uh, they are passionate about. And the other things to notice is that these folks are working on electronics and they're pretty much all of them are using their hands to do something. Also, they are, in this case, they're not talking to each other, but you can imagine that if somebody's having a, a problem, they can just turn to their peer and ask for help. So there's lots of sharing between people. And there's also, also lots of physical activities. Um, and then also the other thing to notice is that they're working on things, but it's kind of unclear what's, what's going on inside of the things that they're working on. And this is actually a common problem with makerspaces, especially when you're doing things related to electronics um, and physical phenomena is that you build things and as long as you have them connected and wired up properly, they will work. But if you if something is wrong in the way you made it, it's really difficult to see why something doesn't work. And that's because there's lots of invisible phenomena that are being harnessed to make things work. So on the bottom here, it's an electronic circuit. So you can imagine lots of uh, electronic circuit, um, electronic signals passing through these wires. Uh, little, there's computations that are happening. There's signals being transformed. Um, on the top here, this is an image of a speaker. So this is actually an old iPad, iPod. Um, and it sends electric signals through this wire. And then on top here, it goes through a magnet that's attached to this cup. And what happens is that this physical device is actually a speaker. So it makes sound. Like it actually plays the music that's coming through this, um, through this electric wire. And so there's this interesting thing that's happening here where the electric signals are transformed into magnetic fields and then they're turning to uh, audio waves. But when you just look at it, you don't really understand what's going on in, inside of here. So we thought it would be really interesting to use augmented in these kind of spaces because they're a nice mix of the real world and the problem that people are having, which is that they can't, they need more information about what's going on. They can't see the invisible. And so in one of our first projects, uh, we explored how people can 
explore and understand what a speaker does. So this device here is actually a, a speaker. It's similar to what I was talking about earlier, where you have a phone and it's sending electricity through these wires. Uh, and then it ends up, the electricity ends up here close to a magnet and a coil of wire, and it basically just generates sound. So you can hear music playing when you play the sounds through the system. And one of the problems is that people build these objects and then they kind of can't understand what's going on if they because they're missing a lot of information. So we decided to put augmented reality headsets and to try to understand what happens to the way people learn and collaborate when they have augmented reality in a context like this. Uh, so with augmented reality, this system becomes very different. Uh, you get to see lots of different things. I'm actually going to walk you through, uh, through the way that our system works. I'm going to change this a little bit. OK, so this is a physical device. It plays sounds. But when you look at it through augmented reality, uh, you actually get to see multiple different things. So you get to see magnetic fields. You get to see labels uh, of the different components. Uh, I'm actually going to fast forward here. Where So if you play music through it, you can see the audio waves coming out, these green things that are popping out. You can see electricity here on the left going being displayed as what's happening in those wires. And in the middle here, you can see the shape of the magnetic fields that are actually changing as the music is playing. Um, and this system is actually physically interactive in that, so let's see. <clears throat> you Not only do you get to see different things, but you can also play with it. So you can take this cup and move it further or closer to that electro electromagnet. And you can get you get to see how the magnetic fields are changing and how the forces are changing that are acting on it. Um, and while the system is playing, you can also observe that there's some physical changes that are happening. So you can see when the magnetic field is in a certain way, the, the cup is being pushed or pulled. So there's physicality of the real world is being visi visibly connected to the magnetic field shapes as the system is being interacted with. Um, so there's lots of kind of interest, interesting and there's lots of visualizations that are happening here. Uh, so something that I want you to kind of pay attention as, as I'm sharing these is the way the visuals have been designed. So you can see that there's 3D magnetic fields that are being displayed here. There's audio waves that are shooting out of the system. Uh, there's labels that are appearing and disappearing depending on what the user is doing. There's magnetic, there's forces. As you can see, there's force arrows in there. On the left here, there's um, also uh, the direction of electricity. It's actually showing the voltage and how it changes over time. So there's lots of information that has been put in here through the augmented reality as compared to the non-augmented reality version, which is on the left here, where a lot of this information is just missing. Like you just can't access it with the naked eye. Um, I guess before I go on, are there any questions about this? I'm going to now sort of shift into talking about the research findings about this, but I'm curious if people have any questions about this so far. Any burning questions? If not, I, I believe on. Andrew Jackson just put a question in the chat. Andrew, would you like to ask that question to the group? Yeah, um, so the, I, I was curious about these visualizations and whether they are uh, simulated or whether it is um, accurate data to the, to the system that the students are observing. Mm -hmm. So in, in this case, it's simulated. Um, and the way, to, the way that decision was made is multiple reasons. Like the students actually don't need to know the very exact shapes of things as they're manipulating this. So we kind of pre-computed the shapes of the magnetic fields, um, and then we just simulated them. It's actually really difficult to measure magnetic fields in real time and show 3D shapes. So that's another kind of issue with creating these kind of visualizations is that you just don't know what the magnetic field looks like unless you, you know a lot of things about the system uh, or you have a lot of sensors in it. Uh, and then the final reason is because the devices that we were working on 
they just couldn't handle to generate all that information in real time. So all of these are kind of pre-computed and they're just they're just 3D models that are being shown or hidden at specific times. Uh, but yes, that's a good question. And it, it relates to how much information you want for the learning activity. Like if the learning activity really involves students to explore how magnetic fields change as they're manipulating them, then in that case, you probably want it to be in real time. Uh, but in this case, it wasn't so important. And so we decided to pre-calculate that. But that's a question that will come up whenever you make these kind of experiences. So thanks for that question. Uh, okay, I'm going to move on then to the next thing. So in these studies, the way we are basically interested in is to understand how do learners differ? How does the learning process and how does the collaboration process differ when people are learning with the augmented reality and without the augmented reality? Um, and so the first question that I think is interesting to understand and to kind of um, explore whenever you're looking at any kind of learning technology, but specifically in this case, an augmented reality system, is whether this experience is bad for learning in any case. So it's definitely really good for learning. So these are these graphs that I'm going to show you have red bars which are the augmented people who saw augmented reality. And then they have these blue bars on the bottom here, which are the people who didn't see augmented reality. So we, we basically did a user study. It's a controlled study in which one group of people sees the AR, the other group will don't see the AR. And they're basically answering some, some questions during this activity as they explore how this system works. And so people who had the AR scored higher on the pre and post learning games than the people who didn't have AR. So it helps. Uh, but something that's important is to ask not just does it help overall, but for what specific things is it helpful or not helpful? So we split up our test questions when we analyze them. And it turns out that people understanding the shapes of magnetic fields, when they had augmented reality, it was extremely helpful for them to understand magnetic fields. Uh, when they didn't have AR, um, it was not so good at their scores of magnetic fields. Also, their understanding of how electricity is related to the shapes of magnetic fields uh, was better with AR. Um, being able to answer transfer questions was, uh, was also better. It turns out that the AR group actually understood much more about how things connect to each other, and they, they were able to transfer it to new situations much better than the non-AR group. Uh, but it turns out that for some things, the AR didn't make a difference, and it was actually even worse. So you can see here for understanding how electricity, the direction of electricity is connected to movement. People, it didn't matter if people had AR or not AR. Um, it also turned out that um, understanding what an amplifier does. So we actually had an amplifier in the back here, which was, sorry, I'm going to hide this again. Um, we had an amplifier, a little toggle button here that changed how the amplification worked. And it turned out that the non-AR people understood that much more what the amplifier was doing. Uh, also, the non-AR folks understood better about how the magnetic fields are related to the movement of the physical cup being pushed and pulled. So it, it does turn out, sorry, it does turn out, this is the same, it's the same graph, but it does turn out that for some things, using augmented reality was actually detrimental to the learning. Like the non-augmented reality experience was better for people uh, than if they had augmented reality. And one of the reasons, there's actually multiple reasons for this. One is that um, the visual field, there's actually lots of things happening here. So in, it sort of like hijacks people's ability to pay attention to things. So when you're designing augmented reality, we think that all of these visuals kind of make people focus on the visuals more. Um, and then also we feel that the people who didn't have augmented reality got to put their hands in and they were basically collecting information through their hands and through feeling and listening to things rather than the people with augmented reality who are collecting information by watching and observing uh, the visuals. So there's a question here about whenever you're designing any kind of experience, what you show to people might distract them from the learning and it might cause them to pay attention to some things, but it 
might take away their attention from other things. So it's really important to ask, um, you know, is this experience potentially bad for learning some things? So that was interesting in that project. Um, I'm going to keep to keep moving, and then I'll take I'll take questions at the end of this section. Um, I'll probably take some questions as I show you more projects. Also, uh, the second question here is: Does everyone actually need augmented reality? And so, as you've seen in the previous project, sometimes augmented reality could be bad, and sometimes it, it's maybe not even helpful. Uh, this was another project in in which this topic came up. So, this is a robot. It's actually just a robot that has. Um, it's based on a on this device called the Google Board. And so it's kind of like a Raspberry Pi that, that lives inside of it. Uh, and it's a robot that has wheels, it moves around, and it also has these sensors on the side. And so you can take it and move it around. And then if you want to interact with the sensors, you know, it's got proximity sensors and light sensors and magnet sensors. And on a computer screen, you can see what these sensors are doing. So if you're watching a computer screen, you can basically understand uh, what each of these sensors is picking up. And so we wanted to understand when you have augmented reality and you're able to take this computer information and overlay it onto the robot, how does that change the way people understand and learn with it? So you can see here, we have this augmented reality system that can take real time information from the sensors and it displays them onto the robot as you're physically manipulating it. So as I get it close to the wall, that sensor goes up because it's picking up proximity and not. Um, and so we built the system, and then we ran a user study in which we asked people to get this robot, to program this robot using a very simple programming environment, like a plot-based environment. Um, the task was to make it go through a maze and to be able to solve certain puzzles of the maze. And this is what it looks like when it goes through the maze. You can see the robot is navigating, and as it navigates, you can see the sensor values are changing in real time according to what the robot is currently doing at any point in time. Um, so this is a robot system. It's augmented. We, and then we were trying to understand how does the augmented reality impact the way people are talking to each other and, and uh, also learning from this experience. And so we ran a user study in which uh, people worked in pairs talking to each other as they manipulated this robot and solved, made, uh, solved puzzles in the maze. And we had two conditions where we, some groups of people could see augmented reality on the robot itself, uh, but then they also had a computer, and so they also saw the sensor information on the computer screen. So that's the augmented reality group. They get information on the robot and on the computer. Well, the non-augmented reality uh, groups of people they didn't see anything on the robot, but they still had access to this computer, and they could see all the information, the sensor information on the computer screen. Uh, now, something that's interesting here is that you can see the space is quite small. So the, the person, there's usually a person who tends to manipulate the robot, um, but they have easy access. They can look at the computer screen if they want, and then the other person can also reach in and manipulate the robot if they want to. So this, because the space is so small, people can you know, take different pay attention to these different resources. And the interesting thing that we found is that with augmented reality, overall, the group of people learned better. Um, but when we looked at the specific people, uh, we had some really interesting findings. So it turns out that the participants closer to the computer, their learning did not vary that much. You can see on the bottom is the red bar, which is showing how much when people had augmented reality. Uh, and they were close to the computer. This is how much they learned. And without augmented reality, uh, they basically learned really similarly. Uh, so for this person closer to the computer, it didn't really matter if they had augmented reality or not. However, for the participant closer to the robot, you can see the AR caused a, quite a sharp change in their learning. So they actually started with um, the people who don't have augmented reality are pretty close to the person on the computer, but actually a bit lower. The scores are a bit lower. Uh, but with augmented reality, their learning just becomes really, really significantly higher. So when this person who's manipulating the robot, when they have access to these visuals, um, it just accelerates their learning. Uh, it makes them learn much better. 
and actually it makes them learn much better uh, even compared to if they were sitting next to the computer. Um, so the augmented reality helped quite a lot for this person. And so something that was interesting here that it turns out that the AR is helping, can be helpful for some people, but not others, depending on what their roles are and what they're doing uh, with their resources. Um, we believe this is happening because the person who's on the right side here manipulating the robot, they are learning while manipulating the object. Um, so the fact that they have AR on top of this robot, uh, we believe that it makes it much easier. Sorry, I'm just going to fast forward to the AR video. It actually makes it much easier to play with this robot physically while understanding this invisible information. And so we believe that the ability to actively engage with them with the physical object and also seeing this invisible information is what accelerated the learning for those people because they can easily ask, uh, you know, they can ask questions about what would happen if I move this close to the wall. Uh, and then they can just watch the effect uh, in real time. So there's actually something really interesting that's that's happening here with the feedback cycle of, of learning while experimenting. However, so it does turn out that AR is improving the person on the right, and it makes no difference to the person on the left. Um, but we also looked at their collaboration, the way they collaborate with each other. And we actually looked at what kinds of things does each person say, and how does each person sort of help to contribute to the problem solving process that's, that they're doing here. So I'm going to show you these graphs. Um, this is, so each of these graphs is one session from one group of people. So the top left here is a non-AR group. You can see there's, there's two people here. Um, and each of, uh, basically each of the lines is that person's contributions over time. So you can see, so on the left here, there's four different groups of people. And you can see that usually in the non-AR, they either kind of, both people sort of tend to stay and not make a lot of contributions, or one person tends to make a lot of contributions and the other person sort of is, is lagging along behind them. Um, but it turns out with augmented reality, you can see these lines are much closer to each other, which means that both people tend to take turns contributing to the problem solving process um, in a more equal way. So with augmented reality, people can communicate with each other and exchange information about the problem and, and basically contribute to the problem solving process um, in a much more fluid and more equal way. So this is something that we've been observing with augmented reality, that it changes the way people collaborate and the way uh, the equality between people. It turns out that without augmented reality, usually one person knows more than the other person, and that person tends to dominate the discussion. But without augment, uh, but with augmented reality, both people kind of tend to stay on the same page because the the AR can provide information that allows them to exchange uh, problem specific information with each other to be able to reach conclusions more easily. So that was an interesting thing uh, that we found from these kind of studies. So. In answering, does everyone need it? It turns out that depending on people's roles, uh, they might not need augmented reality, but it does turn out that overall for you know, their feeling of collaboration and their being able to make progress, um, it does help to equalize people's participation and people's ability to understand uh, the problem more equally. Um, any questions before I move on to, I have two, two more projects that I wanna show you but I'm curious if there's any burning questions. Yeah, I think we have a question from Kyle. Hey, yes. Julian. Um, Hi. So uh, my question was uh, about the, uh, the previous video that you were showing, um, and I was wondering how, how much the results you saw uh, for the non-AR group had to do with the, the fact that they, they essentially didn't have as much stimulus. And so they were playing with the thing that gave them the, the most stimulus where um, the AR group sort of attended to lots of other things, right? Because they had that visual feedback. And so they essentially, which one were they, was it merely time on task essentially for each of these different components um, that yields the results that you see or, you know, 
cumulatively did the AR group learn more? Right. So, uh, wait, I'm trying to sort of break apart your question. So, there's, so if a, I give there's somebody, a you know, a button and that button does something, and I give somebody another thing, and I don't get any feedback from that button, I'm not going to play with that other button. Um, where the AR group sort of had feedback from everything, right? Like they, if they moved the cup or if they did mm -hmm. something, right? They got feedback from all of it. So they probably attended to it. They, they spent time with it. They engaged with it. Whereas the non-AR mm -hmm. group, you know, maybe the reason the amplifier was so much better understood is because they, they sat and played with that one because they got good feedback from that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So um, thinking of how to respond to your question. So we actually looked at how much they each group played with these things, like how much they moved the cup and how much they played with the amplifier. It turns out that they played pretty equally, interestingly enough. But I do think that what you're saying is right in that the non-AR group, because they, the kinds of things that they could attend to were more limited, they focused their attention on the things that they could play with. And hence, that's why they actually learned more about it. Um, so I guess the, the takeaway is that in, given the same amount of time, the AR will sort of change the way people attend to different parts of the system because one, they might see more things happening um, and two, they might, they might be able to kind of explore different topics through the AR visuals. Um, so yeah, so it does, it does seem like it sort of changes their attention. Um, there's something interesting though that's that's in there, which is if they had more time, what would happen? Mm -hmm. uh, and it yes, so that this was a very kind of like it was just a 30 minute activity that they were doing. Um, but it would be interesting to see long term, you know, if then if the AR people then start paying more attention to what the amplifier did because they didn't have enough time to pay attention to it. Thank you. Uh -huh. See Dominic. Uh, I'll, I'll take one more question and then we'll move on. Yes, Dominic. Hey, uh, uh, thank you for taking the, the question. Just a um, sure. clarification, clarification here. So um, in both of the examples you're showing, um, it feels to me like the access to information differs tremendously between the AR and the non-AR group. So basically mm -hmm. the AR group seems to have I have simply access to more information, to deeper information, and this definitely, well, obviously benefits their learning. Um, I was wondering about the second example you showed, um, mm -hmm. just a clarification, what, what you were comparing there. So um, in the graphs you showed, and maybe I, I overlooked something there, that the person having access to the, to the computer, to the laptop, um, did better than the person other way from the, from the laptop, which then changed um, when you add a uh, augmented reality, and I was wondering if oh. um, if I'm just if, if this is accurate or if I'm uh, overlooking something. So I was wondering what would happen if you simply um, give the second person a laptop instead of AR. Would would you expect the same results there, or would mm -hmm. this differ from your experience? Uh, so first, the clarification. I want to address the clarification, and then I want to address your question. So. Uh, the person close to the computer made no difference if they had AR or not. So it, it wasn't like, I guess we gave them the information that was to be able to look on the robot and see what's going on on the robot, but they also had that information on the computer screen. So for this person, basically we gave them access to that information a bit more easily where they could just look at the robot versus look at the screen. Um, so it, and their their learning didn't change, so I guess I, I wanted to to clarify on that. But to answer your question, so there's actually yes, there's multiple sort of underlying components here. One is uh, the AR can provide. In this case, it's providing information on top of the robot. Um, but so in this case, it's not providing. The information is available on this computer screen that both people can look at it. Um, it's not kind of radically new information. Um, in the other example, it was radically new information. Like in this case, people now can see magnetic fields and they can see the electricity. So there's definitely new information being provided through the AR here. With the robot example, 
uh, what's changing is the access to the information. So instead of the person who's playing with the robots, they would have to look on the computer screen to access the information. Uh, but with AR, they get the information more easily. So one dimension is, do you give them new information? The other dimension is, do you make it easy with AR to access that information? Um, and so there's, it, it's really interesting, like the way you were saying is we could have a display here that's more easily, so the person playing with the robot can more easily see the sensor value so they don't have to look at the computer, or we could just put the display on top of the robot, right? Like have some little LCD displays that show the sensor values. Um, that's definitely a really good sort of follow-up to this to see is this information actually needed in 3D? Is it, is it okay to put it in 2D? Um, and then there's, there's something else that happens also, which is the fact that once you have this information, it becomes easier to, to process it while you're playing with the object. So not, I think if you had a computer screen, it would still be a difference. Like if you had a computer screen close to this person playing with the robot, uh, it would still make a difference. I think what's making the difference here is that the information is on top of the object and they can play with the object while looking at that information directly. Um, because you can imagine if you were if you're doing this, but looking at a computer screen, it makes it harder to kind of connect how these computer screen sensors are mapped to the physical object. Um, so there's still some processing that needs to happen here. Uh, versus if you're doing this, you get direct feedback to your actions. So I think there's there's sort of another dimension here which is how quickly can this information be updated in, can you see it while you're physically manipulating the object? Um, and I think that, that makes a difference also. So yes, there's lots of different sort of sub, sub things here. I actually have um, later on, I we probably won't get to it, but I have a, a slide on this about if you, you know, if you have more info, like, if you give people access to information like on a computer screen, does it change? Or if you put information on the robot, like it will display, how does that change? Or get feedback from it, um, how does that change? So I think it's really great that you're you know, thinking about these sub components of what augmented reality is. Um, more follow up studies are needed in order to tease apart all of these topics. Um, Okay, did that answer your question? Is it okay to move on? Julian, we have one more quick question, which is how many participants were in these studies? Um, in the first study, we actually had, um, uh, it was 120 people, so it was 60 groups, um, but actually we had, um, we actually split them. It was so it was thirty groups in AR and thirty groups in non-AR. But we actually had more subconditions, which is why we had so many people. So it was actually uh, two subconditions each. So fifteen groups per condition. We had four conditions. Uh, I wasn't. I didn't show you here. And then in this study, I believe it's close to. Uh, it was probably close to thirty. Uh, thirty groups for each of these conditions. That's kind of what we aim for. Um, at least 20, 20 um, data points per group, uh, per condition. Um, if you get close to 30, that's, that's even better. Uh, it is a bit challenging to you know, run these studies because it, it's a bit hard to get so many people exposed to, uh, to these technologies. One of the studies that I'm actually going to show you later is, was done through COVID too. So that was even more challenging to do. Okay, I hope that answered your question. I'm going to for the sake of time, I'm going to move on. Um, let's see. All right, great. I, sorry, I'm not sure what happened here. I clicked on some buttons. It looks like I've, I've been resharing this video. Can everybody see this? OK, great. I'm assuming everybody can see my slides again. It looks good. OK, great. Uh, 
Perfect. So there's another question that I think is important, uh, which is, are there easier ways to do the same thing? And this ties to the previous question uh, that was asked here, which is, OK, so augmented reality can potentially like give us new kinds of information, or it can give us easier access to the information, or allow us to do things that potentially, you know, once you understand the core reason, what's causing the learning gains or the collaboration gains, you can maybe try to find different ways of doing it without augmented reality. Um, so this is, well, let's see, uh, this is another video. It's, it's actually a project that, um, great. We're trying to explore how can we attach sensor information from the physical world and we just attach it to physical sensors kind of on the fly. So in the previous studies, the, they, all of the objects were created specifically for the study and we created the augmented reality simulations for the study. Now we're interested to know if we let people have access to a toolkit that allows us to measure signals from the world them onto the world, what kind of things can they learn with it? So for example, here you can take a graph and attach it to this physical sensor that's next to this magnet. And when you move the magnet, you can basically understand how the magnetic field is changing in real time by just watching there. Uh, or um, I'm actually going to, this is another sensor of being able to take uh, measure current and voltage and change the resistance of an object. So uh, here in my hand, I have a resistor and I'm changing a potentiometer. So I'm changing the, the resistance value. And on these graphs, I'm going to show two things. I'm going to show a voltage and current. Uh, and so you can see that there's, there's sort of this interesting relationship because when the, the resistance changes, the voltage and current uh, are inversely related to each other. And so with AR, I've basically taken my AR system and connected it to this working circuit. And now we can explore what's happening inside of these wires in real time as we, as we play with it. And so uh, something that we were interested in is we wanted to know if we give people access to these kind of tools, how will it change their workflow? So for example, here I have, I have a little working circuit, something that you would build in a makerspace. This is a timing chip. So on the bottom here, there's an LED that's blinking. And on the bottom here, you can see it's turning on and off. Uh, and it's related to how I'm changing the resistance value. What's important here is that there's lots of things happening in the circuit that you can't see with the naked eye. Uh, there's a capacitor that is changing the frequency of the circuit. And the resistance value is changing the frequency of the blinking circuit. So we just thought it would be really interesting to be able to, for students to take any sort of breadboard with, a, with an electronic circuit and put it in an AR system where they basically have access to a digital oscilloscope uh, through augmented reality. So we built this, uh, this special 3D printed breadboard holder. And it basically allows you to take your breadboard and connect it in, into it. And then it functions like an oscilloscope with multiple probes. So once you, you can connect a wire into any part of your circuit, and then the AR will show what that piece of the circuit is doing. So um, you can see when I'm changing the resistor, this is actually the blinking of the LED light. So you can see the voltage is going up or it's going down, depending on what frequency it's pulsating on. I can also connect the second probe to a different part of my circuit. And the, the blinking in this timer chip, it actually works by charging and discharging a, a capacitor. So you can see that this is now measuring the capacitor as it charges and discharges. And you can see on top here is a mixture of the two signals. Uh, and it's, it's, it's showing you how the charging and discharging is related to the blinking frequency. And so we've built this system in hopes that it would be helpful in a makerspace and in hopes that people will just be able to take their circuits connected here and then have easy access to an oscilloscope. 
Um, usually people who are just learning about how to use makerspaces and electronic tools are kind of, it's daunting to work with an oscilloscope because it has all these buttons and, and, and kind of looks like a very specialized tool that you need to be an expert to use. So we wanted to make it easy for people to, um, to access this information. And so we built a system uh, and it, we, we left it in a makerspace and we wanted to see how people use it. And this system was connected, it requires a HoloLens device. So I'm wearing a HoloLens device on my head as I'm filming this video. Um, it also is connected to a computer. You can see all these wires are connected. They're hard, hard connected to a computer. And so it does require quite a bit of setting up. Um, so we left it in a makerspace. Um, and then we found out that people actually, novices who are just learning to make electronic circuits, they actually didn't want to use it. Um, we tried to understand why aren't they using it as much as we hope. Uh, and it does turn out that you know, this is the poster that we had on the wall. Uh, and in it does turn out that in order to use the AR headset, first you have to know how to put it on. You have to learn these gestures to do in order to start and stop the applications. Um, in order to get the application started, it requires the computer to be working. So you need to log into the computer. You need, we try to make it as easy as possible. You know, you're just starting Unity and um, the system kind of gives you the information, but you do have to start Unity. You have to start a few components, then put on the HoloLens, start the proper application in the HoloLens, uh, make sure it's connected to the internet properly. It's connected to the computer. So there's all these steps that people have to do in order to use the system Plus, they had to take their physical object that they were building uh, and bring it into the computer augmented reality space plot, and then insert it into this holder that was holding their breadboard and then connect it to here. So there was actually quite a lot of effort in order to even get started to see this augmented reality information. So what we learned from this project is that um, when the barrier of entry, the barrier of entry can be quite high for people using these kind of devices. Um, and so it's really important to understand that that barrier of entry will prohibit some people from wanting to experience this. So we actually, we had a lot of people who, who didn't want to use this just because it, it was so daunting uh, and so scary to work with. But by looking at this, it goes back to the previous question that was asked, which is what's actually the important thing that's going on here. And what's important is that people have easy access to this information. So the augmented reality just makes it really easy for people to be able to see this information as they're um, you know, measuring different parts of their circuit. So what we ended up doing with this, with this project is we have built a portable version of it in which you can just, at your desk, you can, it's, it's a handheld device that basically has a, a little display on it. Uh, so it's a handheld os oscilloscope. And you can take it and you can connect it to different parts of the circuit. In this case, you can see the blinking and how it's influenced by the, the relationship of that knob is changing the blinking frequency. Um, so what the augmented reality was doing previously is giving easy access to this information. And so we found out that this is an even easier way of giving access to that information. Now you're looking at the capacitor charging and discharging. Um, so the important thing here is that the augmented reality system was um, not received so well because of the big barrier to entry. Uh, and by understanding what was important about it and what was challenging about people using it, uh, we could design this much easier device. Now it, it's sort of a limited thing in that it doesn't do exactly everything that the augmented reality system did. But what's important is that it's really portable and it can be connected to people's devices. They don't have to carry anything to the augmented reality computer setup. They can just bring this into their, uh, onto their desk and measure different things. Um, and it, it gives them access to easy information about their circuit. So this was a, a really pleasant sort of lesson in, in understanding that there's easier ways of doing the same thing. Um, all right, for the sake of time, I want to show you one final project. And then I have a few more slides that, uh, that might be helpful. 
before we, we go into a Q&A session that's more open-ended. Um, there's another question that I think is important to ask is, what parts of it are actually causing the learning? And it, it definitely ties to the previous question that was asked. So this is a, this is a physics augmented reality experience. Uh, this is an interesting physics phenomenon uh, called Lenz's law, which happens, for example, when you take a magnet and you drop it into a coil of wire, uh, this thing happens where the magnet is dropping, but it's dropping at a slower rate than how gravity would normally pull it to the ground. So you can see this, this magnet is kind of levitating here. Uh, and usually people learn about this phenomenon by either doing the physical experiments like this or by looking at um, diagrams on paper. So in this case, what actually happens is that when you bring a magnet close to a coil of wire, the coil of wire creates a current in a certain direction and that current induces an opposing magnetic field. Um, so students in, a, in an introductory physics classroom learn it by studying these diagrams or by doing the physical objects. And we're interested to understand with augmented reality, how does this change the way they're learning and also their attitudes toward their learning. So we did an experiment. This was done during the early days of uh, 2020. And so Sorry, I'm just drinking some water. Um, the experiment was done over Zoom. And basically the way it works is the instructor, in this case, it was myself, I'm wearing a headset at home, interacting with physical objects. And the AR headset will allow me to see augmented reality on top of those objects while I manipulate the objects. And then I'm collaborating, I'm actually tutoring a student who is anywhere in the world, they're watching this over Zoom. So in this project, we were exploring uh, how can we use augmented reality for remote instruction and what impact does that have on student learning and attitudes and the way they communicate with their instructors. So student is over Zoom, we're doing screen sharing uh, and the instructor is wearing the AR headset. And this is what it looks like when the student sees it, I'm going to make this easier to see. So I'm actually going to try to teach you a little bit about how this, what this phenomenon works uh, by using this augmented reality. So uh, let's see. So this is shot through my augmented reality headset. And you can see there's some physical objects and there's some virtual objects. So there's a physical magnet here and the, there's a virtual overlay on top of it that's showing the south and north pole of it. The overlay is going to move with the magnet when I move it. And then here is a physical coil of wire. And then it's also got this virtual overlay on top of it. And so with the augmented reality system, we can explain uh, how what the phenomenon works of the, the magnet being repelled. So it turns out the, mag the magnet has a magnetic field. Uh, and if you look into the middle of the coil, the cross section of the coil, if you look at that little area, the magnetic field of the magnet, when you move it close, it starts to um, basically strong field lines go through that section in the middle of the coil. So that's an important first, first fact. The second thing is I'm going to use this visualization to show what happens to the flux. That means the change in the magnetic field in the middle of that coil. So you can see when I move the magnet in, uh, or out, the magnetic field is getting stronger or weaker. And what's important is that when I move this magnet inwards, it actually induces electricity that flows through that coil. And uh, if you think of sort of the forces that are happening here, when you move this, when the electricity is induced in a certain direction, it create this green arrow is the mag magnetic force that's generated by the coil. So you can see there's a force that's in the opposite direction of my movement. So as I'm explaining this to students, I was using these visualizations to better illustrate the topics that I was explaining. Um, and actually in here, you can see there's, there's sort of an inverse relationship where as the magnetic field due to the magnet moving is increasing in the coil, the coil creates an opposing magnetic field in the opposite side. 
So with the system, I can sort of create these visualizations on the fly as I'm explaining things to students. Um, and there's another visualization that's going to come into play here, which is as this magnet is moved, the coil becomes like a magnet that has a magnetic field, uh, a north magnetic field pointing at uh, the magnet that is getting closer to it. And so you can see when this, when this coil gets moved toward the magnet, there's a north magnetic field. It basically becomes mag like a magnet with a north magnetic field toward it. Um, so with this augmented reality system, we were interested to know if we allow people to learn in this way and to be instructed in this way, how does it impact the way they are uh, responding and learning? And so in this case too, we did a controlled study in which we had a high AR condition, meaning uh, people saw all the visualizations that I've just shown you. So they could see these, these dynamic visualizations that are changing um, of electricity, magnetic fields. There's also forces that are applied, things like that. And then we also wanted to do a controlled study in which we controlled it with using a low augmented reality condition because we wanted to sort of separate the impact of the augmented reality that's causing uh, motivational effects. So when people are first exposed to augmented reality, there's lots of exciting things that happen to them. And so we wanted to have these two conditions in which the low AR condition they still see some augmented reality, but it's not it's missing some of these educational components. Um, so in the low augmented reality condition, you, we still have a magnet and the coil, which are the physical objects. We still have these little overlays on top of them, but they're not that useful. So we see a, a virtual bar on top of the magnet. We also see a virtual coil on top of the coil. Um, and then we also see a static magnetic field visualization on the left here. So this is just kind of a visualization of a magnetic field that's just, it's virtual, but it's not moving or it's not changing at all. Um, and so we just put this here because we thought that seeing a magnetic field would be useful, um, though it could have been just a piece of paper. So it was really interesting to see the, the people perceiving in the low augmented reality condition, this actually had a lot of effect on them. So, they said they liked it, they loved the fact that it was interactive, and also they could see the real life components of it. Um, some people said that they'll mentally be moving the magnet while they take the test. Um, and also they felt like it was less mental labor, like if, that they could see the magnetic field uh, while doing this activity. And so students have these effects when they had this low augmented reality condition. And the question is, what's causing these effects? And like, um, is it an augmented reality effect? And so the interesting thing is that in, if you think of sort of breaking it down into educational components, there these folks, the students was interacting verbally with the instructor. And so they could ask questions to me. I could give them feedback. Um, so there is an interactive lesson going on. Uh, there's also physical objects that they were looking at while getting the, the verbal explanations from me. Um, they had easy access to the static information of the magnetic field. And then there was also a novelty effect of just seeing these visual overlays. Um, so we think that because people had these sort of underlying components of this learning experience, um, they actually had these learning effects and that they were really excited and they reported sort of simulating this while they're taking the tests. So it just this experience by itself without too much augmented reality had some positive effects on people. Uh, and then the question is, okay, so there's these effects, but then how does the full augmented reality experience differ from this? So there's the first four things are in common in that even with the full augmented reality, I was still talking to the students. They were still interacting. They could ask me questions. Uh, they could look at the physical objects. There were still some novelty effects of seeing this technology. They had easy access to the same information, except now that the magnetic field was actually moving with the magnet. But there's actually quite a, quite a few different extra things that's happening here, which is the representations are now three-dimensional. So you have these three-dimensional arrows and magnetic field visualizations that 
that we were showing in this condition. The visualizations were also changing together. So, it, um, they, so they were dynamic in that, for example, the current and the graph were, were changing, but not only were they changing while I moved the objects, but they also changed together. So there's something interesting about using visual representations in any learning experience in that if you make the visual representations change together at the same time, that helps people to see the connections between them. So for example, they can understand that when the, when the magnetic flux changes in a certain way, also at the same time, the current in the coil is changing in a certain way. So by seeing multiple things, it's not only that they have access to more information and that information is, is dynamic, but also there's more information that's connected to other information, uh, which makes it easier for people to understand things. So with this study, um, we actually, we haven't, actually we've just published the results um, last week, but I won't share with you the results yet, but I just wanted to kind of give you a sense of how are we trying to tease out these, which, which part of the augmented reality is causing what effect. Um, so we did it, in this case, we're doing a highly qualitative study in which we looked at how people are talking and what kind of things they're talking about while they look at these visuals, you know, what kind of questions they ask. Uh, and then we look at how their thinking is sort of moving between different ways of thinking. Uh, so if people are asking basic information questions, how often does that lead them to ask to go into exploration mode? Or uh, if they have just asked a question that's about integrating different pieces together, um, what led to that question? So we basically coded the way people are asking questions. And then now we're trying to connect it to not only how does the AR change the way people ask these kind of questions, but also which parts of the AR are causing what kind of questions to happen. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a methodological um, slide. But um, so I'm done with this section. I just, I have another section that I wanted to kind of quickly go through. Um, I will take a few minutes to go through that before taking questions. But um, the kind of takeaways from this section are that this AR experiences can have, can be both helpful and detrimental. And it's important to understand, to measure things very in detail so that you can find out what is actually the AR, the augmented reality, what is it contributing to and what is it detrimenting. Um, and also consider when to show and hide the augmented reality because it might influence, it influences the way people are paying attention to the learning content. Uh, secondly, does augmented reality, um, is it helpful for everyone? It turns out that it can impact people differently depending on their roles and their access to information and it might not be actually needed for everyone. So it's important to understand, especially because these technologies are expensive to work with and integrate, uh, it's important to understand for whom they are useful and who doesn't need it. Um, then there's also questions about is there easier ways to do it? Um, are there maybe non-augmented reality or non-virtual reality ways to do the same things? And then I think the most important question is to understand what's causing the learning, what specific subcomponents of it are causing that. Um, I guess I'm gonna think of maybe five more minutes to go through. I have another set of slides that are about kind of different kinds of questions, which is when, so the previous questions was how to be critical of looking at augmented reality experiences. And this, the questions here now are about when do we actually really need the augmented reality? And this ties into looking at the subcomponents of augmented reality to really understand what is it bringing us uh, in a learning experience. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm, I'm usually going to have a, an image here on the left, which is the non-augmented reality version of doing things. In this case, this is a, it's a simulation of, sorry, I'm going to hide this because I have some references. Um, on the left here is an iPad application that is uh, meant for anatomy, learning anatomy. Spe specifically here, it's about learning about a heart. And the question is, when do you need augmented reality? Um, there's quite a lot of information being provided by 
to the applications. Um, the question is, when do we actually need AR? One answer to that question is if the content is spatially complex. So if we're trying to understand a spatial structure um, that's hard to project on a 2D screen, it's much better to show it in 3D using augmented reality because people can easily move around the structure using what they already know about uh, how to move around in a 3D space. And it turns out that seeing things in 3D is helpful for helping people understand 3D structures. Also, communicating about 3D content uh, is also another good reason to use augmented reality. When you can take something that's 3D and put it between people, they can more easily understand and communicate about the 3D structures that they're looking at. So first question is, is the content spatially complex? Um, and then the second question is, do people actually need to collaborate about this 3D content? Um, Another question where AR might be helpful is if there's a lot of information that's required at once. So the fact that you can take the physical world and put information in it allows us to, to use more space for overlay for storing information. So in this case, these are labels about the heart. Uh, but as you move around, different types of labels will get closer and will become more visible than others. So in this case, this experience is using this, the 3D space as a way of storing information. Uh, you could give this on a computer screen, but it's much easier to store it in a 3D space and allow people to sort of filter by moving around it. So if there's a lot of information required at once, it might be a good use of augmented reality. Um, very important is our real objects uh, important for the activity. So for example, if you're learning to do surgery, it's obviously better to have an augmented reality system that helps you to learn to do that surgery and it's reactive in real time as you're doing things. Um, another example is this robot example is that in that the physical object is important because it's the core part of the activity. And so if you're putting augmented reality on top of it, it helps people to learn about what that object is doing much more easily because they can physically interact with it while the activity is happening. Um, and be learning about it with AR. So if real objects are important for the activity, augmented reality might be useful, even if it's simple, you know, displaying simple things like sensor values on top of the object. Another question that uh, when AR is helpful is, are body movements important? So in some situations, it's important to leverage people's body movements. It, it kind of varies. So for example, with, with when you're dealing with children, they tend to love to play with physical things. And so in this case, this AR sandbox allows people to really easily reach in and do physical actions to engage them in the learning activity. And in that case, the body movements are important, but also if you're, if you're exploring something or you're learning to do an activity that requires uh, very precise body movements, then augmented reality can also be helpful. Also virtual reality, this applies for virtual reality also. Um, another question is, does the user need attention guidance? So AR is, a, as we were talking about earlier, it ties into the attention system quite strongly. And that can be useful in some situations. So for example, in this case, if you're trying to understand which part of the factory is, there's a problem in a part of the factory, it's much easier to look with AR glasses at the physical object and understand that, oh, this part here it, there's a problem to it, or you need to do something as a repair person, repairman or woman um, in order to fix that problem. And that's easier than just looking at some sort of control panel that just aggregates that information and it's decoupled from the physical object. So on the left here, you could potentially see that there's a problem, but it's much harder to understand this LED here that's showing that there's a problem, Where which part of the factory floor is that connected to? Um, so if the user's attention is needed, um, especially if it needs to be guided in a certain way, AR is also very helpful. Um, there's also another dimension here, which is, is the normal way of doing things inconvenient? So in this case, you're walking in a, in a foreign country and you want to understand what object, what the text is, 
you could carry around the pocket dictionary or translation dictionary, um, but it's much harder because you have to basically look at every word as you're seeing it versus with augmented reality. This is an example from uh, Google Translate. It, you can just basically point it at physical objects and it can give you the information on demand. So in this case, the information is pretty much the same at the end of the day, but the access to the information has been greatly influenced by the augmented reality. Um, you know, there's often cases where you don't want to pull out your dictionary in order to look at things, but the phone makes it much easier to access that and it changes the workflow. Uh, and then finally, there's another question here about are the learners bored? Um, AR can be highly motivating, especially for getting people to attend, to pay attention to something. Um, definitely easier to learn about spaceships when you can see them like that versus when you can uh, learn about, for example, aircraft by looking at this textbook. But um, it's important to understand that this is kind of a novelty effect. It's sometimes you can use augmented reality to draw people into an experience, but they, it might not last after people have um, experienced it for a while. So um, augmented reality could be helpful for making people engaged, but it's important to have other pieces and other affordances that make the learning experience really beneficial with augmented reality. So these were the set of questions that I have just talked about. Um, I guess for the sake of time, I just wanted to end by uh, Thanking, thanking all of you for hosting me here, but also thanking all of these amazing people. Um, some of them are professors, some of them are students that I've worked with. Um, they've all been really great and instrumental in making this research that I've shown you. So yeah, thank you all.